What we're going to talk today about is Active Directory and domains and try to clarify some of that stuff. We've talked about quite a bit of this in the past. Um, the kind of the history of this is starting out with mainframes. We had a mainframe with terminals connected off of there and everything was centrally controlled. I mean, you couldn't do anything without the mainframe. In fact, the terminals were dumb terminals. They couldn't do anything. And so everything's reliant on this very, very central, heavily centrally cent controlled uh, mainframe. Um, moving along through history, um, sort of the extreme response to that is working from complete centralization to complete decentralization. And we came up with the PC or the personal computer. And the personal computer was truly that, completely personal. There was, there was no interaction. It was never designed to be connected to anything else. It was only designed to um, be all by itself. So you had all your own control, all your own data, all your own processing. Everything was done um, locally and separately. Well, as they became popular, there was a need to start sharing data and um, gain things back and forth. So we started out with the very first peer-to-peer -peer networks. And we said, hey, you know what, I'll let you share this. Now that required special hardware and special software to have that happen. And it was very limited in scope. And also you started adding more and more devices to this and it became very bogged down because it just wasn't efficient. It wasn't designed to do that. You start tricking the PC into enabling that at all. Then it came along a little bit truer. Um, the management here is all decentralized, so this computer decides who's going to share. If they decided not to share, they didn't have to. So we had decentralized control, decentralized security, um, and now really redundancy, and you know data was everywhere, and it's just kind of messy. Then came along the client-server environment, where I started with a server, and I connected different clients. It looked very similar to the um, mainframe model in many regards. However, the processing is still happening locally. The control is still local for the most part, and um, my, my data could still be locally, so it's, it's kind of a trade-off. It's right in the middle of a personal computer having all control and all data and everything central to the mainframe, which is um, which would I say? From the PC? I don't know which one I just said. From the mainframe being completely centralized from the P to the PC being completely decentralized, it's kind of in the middle. So I, sh I gave up some control, so I might have a little bit more security. Um, I have my user accounts up here. I, I agree to share my data and put all my data up there. So I'm giving up some things, but I still have my processing power. I still have my memory. I still have some control or, or local say that I want to do. So that's what the client-server environment came across. Client-server environments have their own issues then. As I added server B, I would have um, a new set of users on here and another set of data on there. I secure this over there and I would secure this over there. I would add um, user one and user two over here and then I'd add user one and user two over here and those were actually completely different. Moving on to another server. Didn't want that. We went to another server. If I had another set of users, it might be user one again, user two again, but even though they're called the same thing, they're completely separate accounts. They are not related whatsoever. I could rename these user 11, user 21, user you know, 15, user 25, um, user you know, 13, and maybe even have another user 21, but that's different than this user 21. And you can sort of see how things get kind of confusing at that point. Even if you did name them all user one, the user, the passwords could be different. They might have different restrictions on them. If I wanted to get to this data over here, I would have to make sure that I'm logging in as this user onto that server. And then also I want to have this access to this data over here. I'd have to make sure I logged in as this user onto that server which server is where, became very, very confusing. That is where we are today. We're talking about Active Directory. 
Active Directory is, is not the only and is definitely not the first uh, concept of dealing with network-centric administration. We have kind of went back, uh, started from PC-centric. When we had peer-to-peer -peer networks, we were PC-centric. All administration, all security, all data happened at the PC level. Then we became server-centric. All administration and user accounts were done at a server-specific um, area. So we had server, 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 and now we're moving on to the era of the network-centric administration. Just like we encompassed many personal computers to join into the client-server environment, now we're in, in grouping or grouping together many um, servers into a domain concept. And this is where some of the terms come in. I'll try to clarify it. Please ask questions, though, and say, you know, what does this mean or how does this work out? When I join these things together, this becomes a domain. A domain is an area. A domain is a group of things. A domain is like you think of a king and his domain. You know, these are the villages that I control. Now, I do several things as a king and control my domain. One is to protect, and then one is also to provide. So when I'm protecting, I really am. I mean, I provide security level at a network layer, not a network level, not a network layer, not confused with the OSI model, um, at the network level. And also I provide access, who's gonna come in through a single gate. And um, I provide access to everything within it. So like as the United States has become the United States, I don't have to you know, authenticate with each state anymore as I go from state to state to state. I can just travel wherever I want within that, sort of within here. Once I get in through a little door, then I can access that, or I can access that, or I can access that, or I can access anything else on the network, such as printers, um, data, um, any services that you could possibly think of. So domain is the collection of things that I'm working with. Act of, this is a database. This is a database. Now, these were essentially databases as well, um, but they're locally just on the server. This is a larger scale database that is going to um, keep all these users. So these users are no longer created nor managed at the local level. We bring them all together, we create the server here, and we have it join the domain, and basically we're saying we're going to be using this database, and I can't do my D's and B's, it must be that way, a database. Um, and so I'm gonna look to there for everything. So when a server has some data, it's gonna say, hey, who should have access to this? Let me refer back to the main database, not my local accounts. They talk a little bit in the videos about local user accounts, I think, and then network accounts. Local is could be many different ways. It could actually be local to the PC. What they're usually referring to, though, is local to the server. So there's local server accounts, and then there's Active Directory accounts or network accounts that you're talking about. This is a database, and I forget the name of it. It ends with DIT. Um, NT something DIT. Um, I have to look it up again. Um, but it's an actual file. So it has to exist somewhere. So right now it's just kind of floating in space conceptually. It has to physically reside somewhere. And wherever you decide to put that, and I really apologize for the messy drawing as we're progressing here. If I take the, it just have a server sitting out there and it contains that file, that server is considered the domain controller. There's really nothing special about that server other than it holds that file. It holds the database. Now, does that mean all traffic is flowing through there? Well, not the traffic's flowing through it, but everybody's referencing it. 
So every time somebody needs access to something or somebody needs to know whether their password is expired or needs to know whether they can use their CD-ROM drive, they're all referring that database and it needs to refer to that domain controller. So there's lots of activity to there. And so that's usually why you'll have multiple domain controllers in your environment. So it can load balance that, kind of share that. Very similar to DNS, while most people have multiple DNS servers, your primary and your backup DNS. If one goes down, the internet doesn't go away. You just can't get anywhere because you can't resolve the name to IP addresses. The same thing here. A domain controller goes down, all my servers are still up, all my data is still there. We just don't know how to get there anymore or who's allowed to get there. So that's the idea of domain controllers. So we have a domain, which is a grouping of devices. Um, computers actually join the domain, the servers join the domain. Everything joins this domain, which makes it an area. Active Directory is the database, the database, basically the software behind, like instead of access, it's Active Directory. And it has a whole bunch of tools related with that of how to manage and create objects, delete objects, you know, anything you can possibly think of for Active Directory and the, and the services that are related with that is Active Directory. And the domain controller is the PC that you chose to put that database on. Does that kind of clarify the big picture a little bit. Other questions on that? Well, then how does a tree and a forest? Trees and forests. When we talk about domain, I just gave you an example of a domain of multiple computers and servers um, sort of together, grouped together. So this would be a domain. And when we talk about domains, we talk about namespaces or we talk about uh, a top level domain. Uh, I'll, I'll, let's use one. Go to LTC. So that, that is a domain. And then we have devices with inside there. A domain can have subdomains. And so a domain can have another domain's link to it but it all falls under go to LTC. So I could have a, you know, I don't know. I, they don't have this, by the way. Let's say there's a Manitowoc domain, but it's under go to LTC. L go to LTC dot edu. Well, I'm having a hard time with spelling today. And there might be another subdomain called Cleveland. But again, it's under the go to ltc.edu, so it really is here. Go to ltc.edu. Didn't ever think that'd be so difficult to do. But that's that is considered a tree. So when you have domains and subdomains all put together, this is a tree. And this is typically what we work with. No, 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 no. Nothing to do with websites. Okay. Nothing to do with websites. We use the same namespace concept as like websites. So you're right. You know, you go out to eBay.com and then there's like web1.ebay.com and then server whatever. You know, you can see all those different things for websites. These are actually for devices. So every server that you have. So if I have server one, it would actually be. So if I have a server one underneath here. Its name is server1.gotoltc.edu. Does not have to provide web services. So, but they all it could have be a print something? Yes, they absolutely. All, all so that goes underneath. There is a section, I think they talked about in this section, about distinguished names and relative names and that kind of stuff. The distinguished name is the whole name. Now, I can have another server1 underneath here. And now, if I actually spelled, oh, I should. I should actually spell it all the way out so it's less confusing. I have another server one underneath here, and technically those are two different things. In fact, they are physically two different things. But even naming, this is going to be this is going to be server one dot go to ltc dot edu. This is going to be server one dot cleveland got dot go to ltc dot edu, and they really are two different things. It's kind of like having Bob. You know, can can anybody else name their child Bob because another Bob exists in the world? Well, sure because we have different last names and we have different middle names and different locations, so we identify them differently. Now, 
in general, it's a bad idea to have devices name the same thing within the same tree. And so we wouldn't do this, but they really are different things. So anything that I put into those areas um, or anything I want to choose as a subdomain or any of those objects, they then become their own domain, but they all fall underneath the general idea uh, of the, the, the parent domain. These do have trust relationships. You know, if I'm your parent, child, you know, there's, you know, I trust you. I know what's going on there. So we can share information back and forth. And they're all underneath the, 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 the top level naming. Um, it could be done by location. Like I just did an example like Manitowoc and Cleveland. It could also be done by type. So it could be like, you know, I have a really big research area. So there might be a research.acme.com or whatever. Now, technically, as soon as you have a tree, technically, you have a forest. It's just there. You, you, you can't have... You can't have a tree without a forest. It's just it's just there. Often what we think of though with forests is two or more domains that have different top namespaces essentially. So I'll just throw this out there. Let's do lakeland.edu. And that's gonna be its domain, a domain there. And maybe subdomains underneath that. I, I don't know. Um, it.lakeland.edu and business.lakeland.edu. Just throwing names out there for domains. This is a tree as well. This is a tree as well. So anything underneath that namespace is considered a tree. Now, if perchance. Lakeland bought LTC or LTC merged with Lakeland. It's never going to happen. One's a state school and one's a private school. This doesn't do that kind of stuff. But let's just say that we do for whatever reason. And we want to be under one business entity. We can then form the, the forest then would incorporate two or more trees. And by doing that, there are relationships that happen at that top level that allow it then to be sharing things. So a user down here, a user down there would have direct access to an item down over there in a subdomain of another area. Um, and they would, could, you know, just sort of going back and forth type things. So those are trees and those are domains, trees, and forests. As complicated as that looks, most often, this is what it looks like. Domain, tree, forest. You only have a single domain. Um, that domain makes up a tree just by the sheer definition of a tree, and you have a forest because you have a tree. Um, this is by far the most common business model that you're going to find. Um, LTC is exactly this way. Um, you know, Matwa company probably goes bigger, Kohler probably goes bigger and more expansive with subdomains, but there are very few that actually have a true forest where you have multiple non-equated namespaces that are joined together. Um, so does that make sense? Yeah. You could, the, that guy could have started with that. Because <laughs> yeah. that, that totally made sense to here today. Good. Yes. Now I have. I, I should even go further along in, in our example that we're doing. We're even having a single server um, in a single domain, so we're not even completely utilizing the whole concept of domain. Well, that's not true. No, we've added a second server. So in our example, we have a second server. So that, that's good. At least we're bringing those things together. So, questions? Looking at our learning plan here, we have Active Directory. 
and then um, domain controllers, which we just talked about. Um, sites are a part of Active Directory, more of how we manage things within Active Directory. And that'll make more sense once we get into Active Directory. Um, and then we have organizational units. And it can get a little confusing because there are sites and then there's organizational units that can be used as sites. And it's just a matter of how, what model you kind of use. Um, we're going to use a, just a very generic single site, multiple organizational units, and then create user accounts. The first in-class learning activity says install and configure Active Directory on your virtual server. Um, there is no lab for that. They, they talk about Active Directory. They have you do all this Active Directory stuff, but you never install it. Um, so we're going to take you through that process and, and get one installed. We're going to um, install Active Directory. So you can start up your virtual machine if you have not already. Um, actually, right prior to starting your virtual machine, it's always a good idea on a daily basis to take a snapshot um, while the server is still down. Hopefully you remember that this morning. Um, Pre-Active Directory, uh, pre-Learning Plan 5, something underneath there just so you have some kind of snapshot. If you didn't do it while it was down, um, you can do it now as well. Um, even though it's up, it's not as good of a state to be in. You certainly, at least, you want some kind of backup to be able to get back to this state prior to this on the Active Directory, especially if it doesn't go well. So we want to log in. So Control Alt Insert on the login screen, and the administrator password should be our special password: capital P A dollar sign dollar sign W zero R D. <clears throat> Wait for it to start up. Give a second to fully launch. I want to take a look at my local server, just make sure things are configured correctly there. I should have a computer name. Do you still, do you have a computer name or is there still a generic one like win something? You have it server one? Okay, good. Make sure it's server one. Make sure you have a static IP address. It shouldn't say um, DHCP enabled. It should have a, a static address. And I believe that we chose 192.168.118.11. Um, the time zone is another important factor because so, time synchronization is really important across the domain. And we have um, universal time coordinate, I don't know, UTC minus six for central time for US and Canada. If we're good on there, if anybody needs to change anything here, now would be the time to change that. Now we want to go, uh, we can go back to the dashboard. And the step number two is add roles and features. And this is where we want to be adding Active Directory. So what we're going to be doing is, is installing the software to manage the, the directory. So we're installing the, essentially, we think of it like I'm installing Access. So I'm installing Active Directory, which is a database. It needs a place to put it. So we're going to need to, you know, essentially create a domain controller. Um, before I can create all this stuff, though, it needs to name my database and name the tree and name the domain and, and name all this kind of stuff as we go through here. And so you'll see that process as we do it. It's under Add Roles and Features. And it's a role-based or feature-based installation. It's not a remote server somewhere. And if my other server was up and running, um, which it's not right now, I would have the option to be able to select it from the server one or server two because we did add the server two to our pool. It's not up right now, so it's not gonna be an option. So I do wanna put it on server one. <clears throat> the what I wanna choose is the Active Directory domain service. Let me cancel that. And, and again, it's the second item down. It, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll just click, oh, Active Directory, I'll click that. That's certificate services, that's something different. We want the domain services, Active Directory domain services. 
As you can see, it's going to add all kinds of other things in addition, including the management tools. We definitely want the management tools because that's what we use to manage the domain. And I'm going to say, let's add all those features. So I click Add. And I click Next. And it wants to also add group policy management. And we will be dealing with that later on. So we do want to include that. Verifying everything. And then I usually check the checkbox, restart the destination server automatically if required. That won't have to worry about it. Did I miss a restart or whatever? That's great in the um, environment that we're in. Not a good idea in a production environment. Um, if you decide to add a role or service and all of a sudden you check that box, if it needs to restart, it's just going to bring it down. And usually not a good idea in a in, or corporate environment at 10 o'clock in the morning that you bring down the server. So you wouldn't want to do that. You could apply all this stuff during the day, then at 5.30, 6 o'clock at night, click restart, and then you're up that way. But we're going to make sure that we don't miss anything by clicking restart now. <clears throat> After everything's done, I click install, and we let it do its thing. Okay, when it does finish, um, it's just going to say Active Directory Domain Services. Additional steps are required to make a machine domain controller. And I click Close on here on this screen. And you'll notice the big red flag in the upper right hand corner. And that's your notifications area. If you click on that, it's going to tell you that um, the second one post deployment configuration, promote this server to a domain controller. So, right now, all we did was install the software, the database software. We've done nothing with it. We've just installed it. Now we're saying we're going to make this a domain controller. So this is the place we're really going to create a database on. And so I want to promote this to a domain controller. And now we have a whole bunch of other selections for here. Add a domain controller to an existing domain. That would be going back to the example of I'm creating a subdomain. So, um, no, I'm sorry, no, 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 back up. Um, I already have an existing domain with an existing domain controller, and this would be a secondary domain controller. Remember, we should have more than one, because if one goes down, you can't access anything. No one can log in even to their network. So that'd be adding an, an existing one to an, to an existing domain. This is adding um, a, a new domain to an existing forest. So you have an existing forest, which could just be a single domain or multiple domains or trees before. So like say I did have ltc.edu um, and now I want to do lakeland.edu. This is where we'll be adding a new domain to an existing forest. So it's a brand new domain or new tree that I'm creating underneath there. Or the third and final choice is adding a new forest. And I thought I was creating a new domain, or I'm creating a new tree, and you're creating a forest. Well, you kind of build from the outside in. Before you can have a, a domain, you need a tree. And before you can have a tree, you need a forest. But it's all sort of all linked together. So it, it, it is a little confusing, but hopefully the diagrams earlier may have helped. Um, the root domain name. So this is where we have the, the name that we're going to be working with. And we're going to be using Garopa. Dot com. Thing? It was actually a joint company, Goro and PA for Paul, um, for um, a joint company that we created 10 years ago to do um, network administration because we're teaching different operating systems and different um, network administration, but want to use the same example so you could learn the same company in different scenarios. So it's a very generic company that we'll be using. Um, you'll be looking at the organizational chart in a little bit because you'll be creating users in here and organizational units, but it's an accounting department, a marketing department, a sales department. Um, you know, and just various roles within the company. So it's just a generic company that we came up with. 
So yes, um, that's the root domain name. So that's my original forest. Now, being the original forest, that's also going to be within a tree, and this will become our initial domain as well. So they kind of all fit together and flow together, but they really are separate things. Um, you probably want to maximize your screen. Um, if not, you'll be scrolling back and forth all day long. So to maximize your screen in here, it's Control Alt Enter. If you Control Enter brings you from a window, Control Enter brings you to a full screen. It's less confusing what's going on. In addition, I turn off the menu bar on the top by having the little pin up there. So I click on the pin that goes away. So it's just like a full computer. So, okay, moving along, we have root domain name, agropa.com. And I hit next. And can you select anything for the dot, whatever? Or, would, or is it good practice? Um, it's, it's a, would be a real domain name typically, because this would be your company's DNS then. And so .com, .edu, .org. Um, so it'd be like redcross.org or I mean it, it, whatever, it's whatever your company's okay. DNS name is. Could you put anything in there? Absolutely. Like but then you'll never be able to register it on the outside and become part of the... the well, I guess I'm just talking like making... Yes, if you want to set up a domain at your house, you would not have to um, have a registered domain, but then you'll never ever be able to have it synchronized with the internet and have it passed that way because you can host your own mail here, you can have your own web server. So www.gropa.com couldn't get resolved, but if you just wanted a simple in house, never to go outside type server, sure, you can have anything you want. You don't even need the Don at the end. Um, it's just good practice for the formatting, for the naming of things. So you could have dot fam or something or you know so you could have anything you want in there okay. it's just a really good idea that you're going to have a domain name you know most companies are going to and then that's what you want to be putting in there okay. so okay moving along i just lost my screen okay came back um, the forest function level and domain functional level, um, it's kind of the backwards compatibility thing. Where is your you know, least, your lowest level of server? Um, and you can go back to you know previous version. Oh, that's my only one. That's why it doesn't make any difference. If I was going to an existing one, I could have different domain levels. Um, a directory services restore mode, um, password, this is not your administrator password. This is a separate password used for um, directory services restore mode. So if you want to get into restore mode, this is the password you have to enter. Typically, this would be different than your administrator password. We're going to keep it the same because we want to keep things simple. We're not going to want to remember, what was that password again? So everything in here will be password, capital P, A, dollar sign, dollar sign, W, zero, R, D. And you can click next. Okay, the delegation of DNS server cannot be created because the authoritative parent zone can't be found. That's okay. Um, we'll come back to DNS stuff later on. It is going to verify, and it should come up with the NetBIOS name automatically with the um, the domain without the .com. So that's going to be your, your NetBIOS domain name. Clicking Next again. All the defaults here, there's very, very little reason that you would ever have to install any of this stuff in a different location. But say you wanted to put on your D drive or your F drive or a completely different directory structure, you're just really advanced at that point, I guess, if you want to keep track of where other stuff is. Defaults are good for the operating system and Active Directory. Here's just an overview. Here's all the stuff that you chose. Do you agree with everything? Yeah, you probably would. And you click Next again. Okay, it took a while for the prerequisite check. Um, when it does the prerequisite check, if there's only yellow air, um, yellow warnings on there and nothing worse, you're okay. It is possible that you chose something earlier or something's just not right. If anything turns red, 
that's bad, then let me know and I'll come over and check out what it is. And we'll have to fix that. You won't be able to install it with a red um, warning, but just the yellow ones, you know, you can. So if everything looks okay, you click install and then you wait again. The initial thing that we started was um, we installed the software, the Active Directory software. Then we said we're going to make it a domain controller, so we're creating a database. In that database, we have to name the database, and we have to give it some kind of structure to the database. So we're giving it a, a forest name, and therefore you know, there's a tree underneath, and we're creating a domain underneath here. So there's a lot of structuring that's going on right now. So the software is there. This is the structuring part of putting all kinds of items in there. Users, some the administrator users automatically created. Um, there are some groups, I should say, organizational units or well, and groups that are automatically created in the structure. You're going to have, you know, this. It's, it's a base building of a database that we're doing right now. So that's why it's taking a little while. When it restarts, you can log back in, Control Alt Insert, and. Um, what you should notice is that you're now logging into domain. You're no longer logging into the local machine. Um, it says Gropa being your organization. If I click the back arrow key, um, you can click in as another user. It's going to default to logging into the domain from now on. It's going to want to log in always to the domain. You can force it to log into the local machine or to any other local machine by typing in the server name with a backslash. So now it's going to be logging into a local machine. So if you had local user accounts, or even if I logged in as administrator right now, this would be logging in to the account that we created on the local server called administrator. It could potentially have a different password. It could potentially have different access. Well, administrator probably wouldn't. But you know, think of server one, Bob, is going to be the user that you created on server one. That's going to be different than the Bob that's going to be in the Gropa because now we have one place that we're going to keep the names from now on. So let's go on back. I will log in as Gropa Administrator. That's what we want to do. Um, just want to point that out so you can see that though. And how you log in as different users if you needed to or wanted to. Once it starts up, the server manager is going to make the load. Kind of do it stuff. If you notice in the dashboard area, not the dashboard, but in the left hand column it's listed, you now have additional items over here. You didn't have this before. You only had local servers, all servers, and file and storage, but now you have Active Directory, Directory Services, and you have DNS. DNS and Active Directory services are really, really tightly integrated. And as we get through the rest of the course, you're going to see that. We're not going to do a lot with the DNS today right now, but you're going to see how, how tightly, tightly it's integrated. If I go under Tools now, you'll also see a lot more items on your list. Um, starting out with the first five right to begin with. Active Directory Administrative Center Service, uh, I'm sorry, Active Directory Administrative Center with the Active Directory Domains and Trusts. Then you can see all the domains if you have a multi-domain multi environment. Um, PowerShell sites and services. And one that we'll be using extensively is users and computers. So now this is where we're creating and using the users' accounts and organizational units. And in fact, we'll just go into it real quick. We get into it a little bit later, but I might as well show it right now. Here's what's already created. So under Active Directory Users and um, Computers, we see at Gropa.com. If we had multiple domains, they would be lift, listed here as well. LTC.edu, Lakeland.edu, Acme.inc, or whatever it's going to be. And that would be your forest. So it's showing your whole forest. By clicking on the little arrow next to Gropa.com, if I had subdomains like research.gropa.com, that would be listed in here as well. It does some, come with some built-in organizational units. 
These cannot be changed. They can't be renamed. They can't be deleted. Um, they're just there. If you look under users, if you click on the users, you're going to see all kinds of users and groups. It should actually be named users and groups because groups are here as well. A user is a single icon, person icon. A group is a two person icon. Um, so it's not always, if you don't see this column, it's hard to get them mixed up. The two users that are automatically created are administrator. Um, when you create your domain controller, it pulls the administrator information from your local server. So if you called, if you had the password for your server one, server something else, it would pull this in. If you had certain restrictions for whatever reason in your administrator account, that pulls it all in as your original user. Um, the other user account that's automatically created is guest. If you notice next to guest, though, there's a little down arrow, which means that the account is disabled. So by default, the guest count is disabled. And that's a good idea. You don't want a guest logging into your server. You know, you want to control who's in, um, who's going to be accessing what. So there shouldn't be this generic, oh yeah, if you forget your password, just use the guest account. Uh, you can enable it by right clicking on it and you can enable the account. Um, and we're going to get into all this stuff later on. We talk about user management. Um, we can add them to a group. We can reset a password. We can move them to a different container, um, delete them, rename them, and look at all their properties. We look at properties of a user. We have a lot of options underneath here. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, though. Um, so when I create organizational units and delete organizational units, um, there are some labs that are in there. I might wait on those labs. If we have time, we'll come back to them later. Um, I want to do the ones that we, I want to make sure we get to the stuff that we, that we want to get through here. So to look at that, if you want to go out to the server that we typically go out to, um, let me bring this up. The If you go to backslash backslash in Windows Explorer to 192.1, no, 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 that's not it. Nope. 172.16.192.20. You should be able to go to the class folder and then server, I'll see if it's ever admin one. It is, good. Server admin one, there's an org chart. It's a PDF file. It's a Gropa org chart. Go ahead and grab that it's to your local machine somewhere. To your, to your portable hard drive is where you should be putting it. And this is what it looks like. So it's, it's, it's kind of a typical organizational structure. We have a president, and there's an assistant to the president, and then we have different departments. We have a sales, operations, accounting, information systems, then human resources. We're going to skip Arthur Anderson, so just sort of don't even think that exists. We'll come back to that later on. Some of the departments have um, subdivisions, such as an Eastern Division or Western Division for sales. Um, the operations are, sh are split into shifts. Um, we're going to come back to some of that stuff later on. Right now, we're just going to work with these as whole departments, and we want to create a place of organizing users. Think of an organizational unit as very similar to a file folder structure. I need to organize all my files, and I can put all my files under one directory called classes. Well, most people probably don't do that. They probably separate it by class. There's a server admin one class. There's a network design documentation class. There's a networking one, networking two class. It's a way of easily being able to find it. The files really don't care. Just like here, the users really don't care where they're located. It's more for us for administration. Later on, it does make it easier, though, for us to administer them so we can have all the people in this department have the same rights. All the people in the same department have the same um, access to things. So it's, 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 a, it's a nice, clean, administrative type aspect of things. One thing that can be a little confusing is what do we do with the president? How would you organize this structurally? 
Well, many times what we think of is, you know, uh, on a top-down approach, we think of, you know, here's the president or the executive department, and then, you know, underneath there we might have information systems, and we might have human resources. Is that, a, is that really the model that we're looking for, though? It is organizationally, absolutely, because sort of top-down approach, the executives sort of give you your vision and your direction, have overarching policies, and going on down, hierarchical and network administration-wise, it's not really that way. I don't give rights at the executive level to have it flow down to everywhere. It's still its own container. So we'll have, you know, say that Gropa is our um, domain, and then we have organizational units underneath there. We would have executive and IT, IT and HR, all equal levels. There isn't, because there are some times that you want the executive people to have certain rights, but they're not going to have all the things that are going to flow all the way down. Not typically. You know, would you want the vice president to be able to just change a design on a project or something when they have no idea about engineering or about the design software or whatever? No, there's still some limits that you put on there. They might have some special rights overarching, but that's, you know, it's still a separate area. So I work with organizational units. That's about the only confusing part, you know, looking at an org chart. Otherwise, org charts are, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it's, we have a department, we want to keep them together, so that's what we want to do. So looking at our server, I have Active Directory users and um, computers. So if I launch this, I can create, let me maximize this here, under the users area, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, under Gropa, I start building my organizational structure. So now I know this is a little confusing because you have my screen on one screen and you have your server on another screen and then you have to have your org chart up someplace else where you can sort of see it. Um, no, I want to do this. So next year we'll just have to put triple monitors for everybody. <laughs> Sorry, we just need it, you know? My screen, the, the reference material, and then the server we're working on. So anyway, so working with the Garopa, um, I can start creating new organizational units. Now, everything like in modern day computing, um, there can't just be one way. There are probably 15, 16 different ways of creating an organizational unit. I can right click on Garopa, and I can go to new, and I can choose organizational unit. I can click on the little folder icon type thing up on top, and it says create a new organizational unit. As long as you have Gropa selected, that's where it's going to create it. Organizational units, by the way, can be nested, so you could ultimately put a new organizational unit underneath computers or whatever. It just doesn't make sense to do that. Um, you can right click in the open area over here and choose new organizational unit. Um, you can go under the actions. No, yeah, actions. Yeah, actions, new organizational units. So there's multitude ways of doing it. There is no one right way. I'm not going to grade you on that. Lab Sims let you do it any way that you want as well. So that's kind of nice. However you do it, um, we want to create a new organizational unit. When I create an organizational unit, it just asks you for the name, and that's pretty much it. And so our first one might be executive. By default, it says protect the container from accidental deletion, and it's on there on purpose because um, it's kind of easy. Active Directory is just at the registry. It's a real live active database. It's always running, and if I just accidentally go to, oh, um, I want to delete this user underneath executive, and inadvertently I had the selection on executive instead of the user on the right hand side, I would delete executive. Well, no big deal, right? Well, actually you delete executive and everything under it. So you could take out a whole department or a whole company with pretty much two clicks. Right click, delete, and then okay. So right now I can't delete it. 
Are you sure you want to delete it? Yep, I do. Oh, I don't have privileges. I'm the administrator. How can I not have privileges? Well, let's look at the properties of it. There must be something under properties. I click under properties, and I really don't have an option here to get rid of that. Well, to protect you from yourself, Microsoft's always looking out for your best interest. Um, we're not going to let you see things all the time. So in order to delete this, this is important because there are times you need to delete things. Um, it's going to be under um, view and then advanced features. You have to click advanced features under view. Now it's like, oh man, I see other things. But in addition to this, if I right click on executive now, I have more tabs. One of my tabs is object. Under the object tab is protect this object from accidental deletion. So if you accidentally delete an organizational unit, you really worked at it. Um, you'd have to go under the view and go under advanced and show the advanced feature. Then you'd have to go under object. Then you have to uncheck the protect from accidental deletion. And then you'd have to go to executive and then hit delete. And then are you sure? Yes. And now it's gone. So there is no accidentally, oops, you know, you'd have to deliberately do all those steps each time. So, okay, moving along though, let's create these quickly. Um, a new organizational unit. And I'm going to create the first one called executive. I want to create another one. Um, I'll just use the icons up on top this time. The next one's going to be sales. I want to, oh, seeing this is where I made a mistake. Made a mistake on there already. Um, I didn't make sure that group was highlighted. It automatically defaults the last one. So um, right click, properties, object, protect from accidental deletion, apply. Um, I can move this. I'm just going to delete it. Well, let me try to move it. Move it right to Gropa. And I have sales down here. And I should put accidental deletion protection back on. Okay. Okay. Make sure that's selected. Now new one. And I'm working with operations. And I click OK. Click back on Garopa. New accounting. New organizational unit IS. And our final new one is HR. So um, the bad, kind of the bad thing about that is it does intermingle all of your organizational units with everybody else, with, with the default ones, with the built-in ones. So you do have to watch out for them, and you have to like really pay attention to where they are and what they're called because they can get a little hidden in there. We can just get into the starting of creating users. We don't do a whole lot with managing them, but as long as we're in here working with the Gropa org chart and we have the organizational units already created, it's pretty easy to create our users. So if I go under the executive container, I, I don't have any users here. Now you're going to say, well, don't have a users container down here? You do. And this is where you can dump all your users, but this is kind of like your documents folder on your hard drive. You just don't dump everything there. Most often you organize your stuff someplace else in an organizational structure means, and that's really what you do. So we're not going to create our users underneath here. We're going to be creating them underneath each of the organizational units that we created. So I'm going to exe um, executive, and the same thing. I have you know six different ways of creating a new user. Um, if I have executive chosen, I just click on the little person icon just the single person icon, and it brings up a new object user prompt. It's going to ask for a first name, and, and on the org chart, um, everybody has the, everybody's first name is selected. Wasn't very creative when we created this. We didn't put last names, so we're going to have this one big happy family business. So they're all going to be your last name. Um, so it's just your, it's your extended family, your kids, you know, their spouses and 
cousins and in-laws. They just happen to all have the same last name. If you don't use your last name, use Smith. I don't care. Uh, it doesn't make much difference. The user login name will just be the user's first name. Now, we're not going to get into the whole philosophy of user naming. Um, every company has their own ideas and thoughts behind that. Um, small companies can usually get away with like a first name, maybe last name, last initial like Paul B or whatever. Large companies can't. LTC certainly couldn't with you know thousands of students. We actually have so many duplicate names with students. You think that names are unique? They're not quite so unique. Um, yeah. We're going to just go to just numbers. Everybody's going to have a unique number. So you get a serial number when you're born, and that's just that what it is. And we kind of do have, anyway, whole another subject. So anyway, um, we could go to all these names. You do last name, first initial, but then we have duplicates with that. How do you, how do you deal with uniqueness for naming within a company? And you have to figure that out. There's all kinds of ideas out there. LTC does it with combinations of an ID and your name, so it's kind of personal, but kind of numberish, um, whatever. Even like when I was hired, they used to start with the first two letters of your first name and then the first two letters of your last name. So I should have been P-A-B-E. There already was a P-A-B-E from like a Pat Benson or I don't know what it was and so they had to like just randomly add characters so I was P-A-U-B-E and and then other people had to add a third letter to their last is just there was no standard then so trying to find out a standard so everybody knows what the standard is and be able to you know make it unique everywhere it is a really struggle we made it really easy everybody has a unique first name there are no duplicates within our organizational unit Anyway, moving along, we have the user login name, which we'll just make as the first name. Um, so when we log in, we'll be logging as Madison. So that last name really doesn't have a whole lot of effect. When we click next, we need to have a password on there. And to keep, so we have to remember all these different passwords, we'll keep them the same. Capital P A dollar sign dollar sign W zero R D. P A dollar sign dollar sign W zero R D. And the user must change the password for the next login. That will really confuse us because then we're going to have all kinds of different passwords on there. Obviously, in the real world, you would. If you changed ever, ever change the password for a user, make sure that's checked. You, as even as an administrator, should never, ever know anybody's password. Because if you do... You're kind of like, well, that person knows my password. All these things happen underneath my user account, but that person knew my password, so they could have logged in as me. And it's just like, you don't want anything to do with that at all. So that person is identified solely by their password. I'll change it. I'll let you get in. But it forces them to change the password for the next login. You have to do that. Um, we're not going to mess with, you can't change the password, but we will choose password never expires because it's going to expire and then all of a sudden, you know, half the class is going to have password one and then password two and what password was I last week and it gets really confusing. So it's password and we're going to keep it that way. Again, not ideal for a real world, great for a teaching environment. And then we click next and we click finish. So that's that's pretty much it. Not Not a real big deal. If I want to create another user, make sure that you're choosing the right organizational unit. Click the user again, and then we can create Robert. Robert, click next for the password. Uncheck that, check that, click next, and then finish. So I've created my executive department. So what I want you to do is take the next, I don't know, well, take a break. When you come back from break, take about 15, maybe 20 minutes and create the rest of the users in all the rest of the departments. So under sales, let me just bring this over to you. So in sales, what we're talking about, that's going to be everybody in here, including Joshua, the manager, Matthew, the um, a manager, and so forth. Operations is a big department. Lots of people in, in, in um, operations. We have these people in accounting. 
with these people in information systems and these people in HR. And that would be our executive. So I don't know, it's 30 people I roughly. Um, you, it shouldn't take you a minute a person. So I'm thinking 15, 20 minutes. So go ahead and take a break. Come back and finish that up. Another section of your um, the, 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 section, the sections we're talking about in lab sim dealt with user management facts, um, creating users, managing users. We'll take a look at that in a second. Also talks about using templates. I'm not going to cover that until next week because next week we cover groups and templates make a whole lot more sense once you start working with groups and then there's a reason for templates. Um, we're also working with bulk user imports next week as well. But for now, let's just take a quick look at some of the um, just the basic user management things. I alluded to some things before. Let's just pick a person in IS and we have Lauren. So we're going to pick on Lauren and IS. If I right click on Lauren, I can disable her account. Why would, why would I disable Lauren's account? She's fired. Why wouldn't I delete her if she's fired? To give a new user the same accesses. Absolutely. So if somebody comes in, um, you know, Terry comes in, I can do a rename the user and give, now Terry can log as that user. Another really good reason not to delete a user and disable them instead if they fire, quit, whatever. Okay, it could be a long-term disability, it could be a maternity leave, it could be surgery, it could be, you know, spending a month in the Bahamas or whatever it's going to be if you're gone for a long time. But even if the person leaves, they quit, they get fired, they get escorted out by a troop of security people, you don't just delete the account for multiple reasons. One is, once you delete their account, you lose all reference to everything that they have had access to. All the log, inf well, the logs don't disappear, but all any file information of ownership or access, that kind of stuff, all goes away. In case you need that information, it will no longer be available. Another reason is it's amazing how many people that get let go come back. Um, never quite understood that phenomena. I was never in HR. I don't know. I don't care. I just disable and enable accounts as I'm told. That was my job. Um, but it's really easy to do. So there's multiple reasons that you want to do that. Don't delete people though. Um, if you're sure they're gone, don't delete them. Let it sit for six months, three months, whatever your time frame is that you want to set as a company and then maybe go back and purge some of those. Um, but having that user out there is a whole lot easier to bring them back or to give them to somebody else's account or whatever than trying to recreate them and get all the stuff back for there. So that's one really easy one. I can disable the account and I can re-enable by simply right-clicking enabling on it. Um, this is the only way that you can do it. Um, I, if I go into properties of here, I don't have the ability to enable or disable the account. Another really weird thing is under, we have, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty 20 different tabs on there, um, including the account tab. Um, I have a million different options underneath here. Everything except resetting your password. I can't reset your password. I have to do that from a right click as well. So I'm going to right click, reset their password. So uh, there's some features that you have six different ways of doing it, like creating users or groups or organizational units. Other activities, there is only one way of doing it and the resetting password is one of those. So find the user and click reset the password. If I click reset the password, it doesn't ask you for the old one because you're the administrator, you shouldn't know the old one anyway. And then you do have other options as well. We're gonna get into this a little bit later on um, when we talk about more security, but typically the user will call you to reset their password after they locked their account by having so many incorrect attempts. So that is a built into the same screen where you can just click on it and say, I'm going to unlock the user account at the same time. Otherwise it would be two steps, change the password, then go back in and unlock the account. Um, we don't even have our stuff set up right now to unlock the account. So I'm gonna hit cancel there. Can users see the descriptions you put on them? Can you like rate people by how cool you think <laughs> they are? Um, um, I don't know. I would be extremely cautious with that. You know, this is the dork on the fifth floor. 
may not be appropriate under a description of a person, or this is a very attractive person in accounting or whatever, not, not appropriate. This is all business professional. Um, what's that? <laughs> so um, other right-click features you have here, um, you can add them to a group, and we're talking about groups next week. Um, disable repair, uh, move them. They move from accounting to HR. Um, we can just easily move them to a different area. Um, we can cut them, so we can paste them someplace else. We can delete them, rename them. And then under properties, I do want to spend some time under properties. Properties is a lot of information underneath there. I mean, uh, just under general, we have their first name, middle initial, last name, what's going to look like on the display. This is what the description is. This is all professional. What office they're located in. You can put telephone number, email, if they have a web page or whatever it's going to be. You can have all kinds of information under there. In addition, you can have more detailed information like an address. So you could keep this as part of your actually HR's personnel file. You know, what, what are these people's addresses? You can look them up. And you can secure that so other people can or can't see that. Um, this is not used very often, but it is there. The account tab has a lot of stuff underneath it that, you know, at having 20 tabs obviously isn't enough. You know, we have sub menus and things underneath, um, which kind of makes it really confusing. The user login name is here. You can change your user login name. You know, it doesn't be called Lauren anymore. It would be called Laurel. I'm not sure. Um, and um, it could just be a typo. You can change it. We have two different tabs underneath here, two different buttons we can work with. One is the log on hours. This is the times that you're allowed to log on. Right now, log on is permitted all the time. Say that I don't want, um, oh, I should do this way. I don't want my people to work on Sundays, so I select that area and then I say disable the log on. Say that I don't want them to work on weekends, so I disable Saturday and Sunday. Um, I want to give my employees, oh, you know what, it's been a long work week, we're going to cut out at 4 on Fridays, and um, it's really important that we take breaks during the day, uh, well, actually starting in the morning, you know, I, your rest is important, we're not going to start until 9, no one starts until 9, and everybody's gone by 5, oh, 4, we'll make it 4. And then um, breaks for the day is important, so we'll take a noon hour lunch, an afternoon break, and a morning break. And working five days in a row is just really unreasonable, so we're taking Wednesdays off. Um, so there's your work week. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, you can't tell them when they're going to log, are able to log in. It does not log them out if they're currently logged in. It does just not label them log in. This is more of a security feature than, you know, trying to, you know, improve morale by not having people being able to work. It is if, if I'm not in on the weekends, no one should be able to log in as me. So a cleaning person comes and cleans your keyboard, wipes underneath, finds your password. Oh, let me log in. Is they're not getting in. Um, there is no chance of them getting in. Weekends are a great time also for you know the brute force attacks. Let it run all weekend. Um, even if they get it, they're still not getting in. Um, so it's 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 more along those lines that you have this type of, of security. So I'm going to disable that though. Also log on to. Um, you can say this account only logs on to this computer. So in all those movies where they have that one console which manages the entire world's global operations of security or whatever, you could literally have that. So this computer is the only computer that the president can log in from. And you know maybe he or she wanders and you want to keep them contained, a uh, bad reason to do that. Um, or it's an administrative console. You're not logging in as administrator unless you're in this super sealed room with security guards. And so again, even if somebody tortures you, tortures you and gets an admin password out of you, they still can't log in because they're not on that computer. I use some really extreme cases, don't I? This is like... Um, 
So it's, it's it, and again, you know, so I overhear you having a password or something, you can't log in from your computer. It's only from this machine or a series of machines. Accountants can only log into an accounting machine or whatever. So you can designate what it's going to be. As you can see, default is all the computers, and you probably want that in most cases. Um, I unlock the account. This, um, there's no lock the account button. Um, you can say, I want to lock the account. You can disable the account. This is only there um, under the password management profile stuff. And again, we'll talk about that later. Um, if they log in so many times incorrectly, this will be locked. Their account will be locked. This is how you unlock it. So it's kind of like a one way click. You know, you can't lock the account, but you can unlock it. Then you have a lot of account options underneath here. Um, if you scroll down, you know, I guess this tab wasn't big enough to have all the options. So there's a scroll bar, which is confusing because people don't always look because um, there are things down lower, which can be important. Um, the most obvious ones are towards the top, though. User must change the password to the next login. So for whatever reason, I can choose everybody in the department and I can click a user must change the password to the next login. I think there's a security breach. I think passwords probably could have been compromised. I can check everybody and say you're changing your password the next time you log in. Um, or for whatever reason, the user can't change their password. I work with Lauren specifically. Um, maybe Lauren keeps changing her password and never can remember what it is and she's calling for help all the time. No, Lauren, you can't change your password anymore. This is it. I know you like the password of the day, um, but you just can't remember it, Lauren, so you're not changing it anymore. Uh, this is not on by default. A password never expires. Bad idea. The password should expire based on the policy profile um, uh, policy, the password policy that you're working with. Uh, this is just for our example so that, you know, two months down the road we're not bouncing around passwords. Um, the other one, this again, since some really in-depth security ones which we're not going to talk about, so the password using reversible encryption. Um, not a big deal for us. Account is disabled. Um, that is not one that's visible on the screen, unfortunately. I'd rather have is your account disabled visible as opposed to reversible encryption, um, me personally. Um, but that is the checkbox. Austin, you log in as Lawrence. You can't get in. How can I do this? So here's a place that you can disable and then un enable the accounts. Smart card, account sensitive, and Kerberos, and the rest are just advanced security things. Account expires is another really, really good feature. You can have the, why would you have an expiration date on a, an account? A temporary employer contractor, absolutely. It's a six month temporary internship. Who's gonna remember six months from down the road that I have to delete this person? I'm not gonna remember that. So when I create them, six months from today is July 15th. I'm gonna put July 15th. The account is disabled after that point. Yes, Adam. That that is one theory behind that is about uh, a contractor's information was compromised, and even though they didn't have access to anything, it gave them access to the network. And most security is at a perimeter level, like we don't want bad people coming in. Once you're in, we provide some security. Well, that gave the in, and then being able to sort of mess around inside and play around for a while and see what can do. Yep. Yep. Um, but a contractor is a perfect example of this or an internship. This is once done. Uh, another example I like to give, another extreme case. Um, you know that Bob is going to get terminated on Friday because HR has told you. And, and, and Bob, you know, reads the gun magazines and the weapons of mass destruction websites. And, you know, he's a very angry person. Um, you know, I might not be in that day, but I can disable his account ahead of time and I'll make sure that I can do this. And so, sure at your door as well. um, no, I won't even be there that day. <laughs> you know, here, here's his last day, you know, let HR figure it out. And anyway, um, but you know, contract stuff, obviously in a year long. Um, what if you forget 
And like, oh, they didn't tell you, like, oh yeah, we extended the contract for three months. How would you ever know? They'll call you, I can't get in. Um, and then you log on the account and you extend it for another three months with proper authorization, of course. You don't just say that from the contractor, oh yeah, they extended me another year. Really? Can I get that from pa on paper somewhere? Okay, so you have all kinds of account information under here. Um, profile. Um, it's more in depth. Um, we have home folders. It could be a local path. It could be a, a, a network drive. We talk about profiles later on. Telephone numbers. Again, I would probably put telephones next to addresses. You know, here's a home number, or whatever. Organization. This is just general job description information. Where are you located? What company? Who's your manager? I'm not sure why you would choose that, but anyways, you can. Um, don't do much with these. Um, security is just rights. What do you have access to and who has access to you? So um, everyone um, has some, um, everyone has the ability to change their password. And to yourself, you have the ability to read your own information. Um, and it sort of goes down. It gets, don't worry about that. Environment, sessions, remote control. Let's see. I was getting messed up in these rows. Members of. We'll go to members of. This is where we work with groups. Next week, we work with groups. What member, what groups are you a member of? And you could add or remove groups from there. So. Um, that's all I want to talk about there. There's just a lot of stuff you can talk about and get into, but those are the most important aspects of it. So that's the user management type of things. Um, where is my... I seem to have removed my learning plan. That's what I kind of thought too. So looking at the learning plan, we have um, dealt with installing and configuring Active Directory on your virtual server. Um, we've created the organizational structure for your virtual server, and we have created the Gropa user accounts on there. Um, so those are the main areas that we talked about. Um, any questions on any of those aspects? So for the rest of of the time, so you have just over an hour to work on this. You can work on creating organizational units. Um, it's actually simpler than the ones we did. Um, they'll tell you what to create where. Uh, deleting an organizational unit, I already showed you the secret. It's a matter of doing it. And then creating, um, I think you only have like three or four user accounts <laughs> to create. And you're gonna say, this is a piece of cake. I just did 30 of them. Um, and then managing user accounts, just changing some names and changing some properties of them and working with it. So um, that's your stuff to work on. I would suggest that you do it here in class. So if there's a question or something along the way, we'll take some time at the end and go through any of those lab systems that you want to. And we can you know, clarify any questions. Sometimes they can like, what were they asking or where's this feature found again and get to play with it. You've done a lot of work. You probably want to shut down your virtual machine and take a snapshot. You do not want to lose those people um, unless you really like typing and just want to do it again. Um, so you want to take a snapshot when the server's down and saying that I've created organizational units. Um, so post OU and users or something like that. So after the fact that you've created those. So the question deals with sites. How do sites fit into all this? Um, it's kind of extra information. Uh, it can be valuable, especially if you're working on um, networks that are wide area. Um, the example that David gave, if I have one, oh man, that was bad. If I have one domain called, you know, Acme, acme.com, it is one domain. It, it's all under that namespace. But I could have an office in, you know, Los Angeles and New York. Um, if I have this example, I have a domain controller somewhere. And so I have a domain controller there. 
Now, if I have a domain control over here, that means that everybody is authenticating. So when you log in, and every time that you access any network resources, it is looking at that domain controller. That may or may not be a good idea. Um, if you have two people in a remote office, big deal. It's going to be a little bit slower for them. Um, but you know, as far as the infrastructure, you're not going to put a server in there. You're not going to be doing other stuff or whatever. Um, but if it's you know a substantial office, that's a lot of authentication every single time that you're trying to do anything on the network. So you could have a local server over here, but you're still authenticating and then give an access back to there. And across a WAN link, not a good idea. So there's the, uh, well, what if I put a second domain controller on there? Because you show a backup one there anyways. Absolutely. Domain controllers, though, are, however, want to stay in sync. So domain controllers have to stay in sync to know what's going on. So every time that you make any administrative changes there, it's being synced there all the time. And so there's lots and lots of things going on. Again, the domain is not just the users, but there's all kinds of other stuff that's going on. It's similar to the registry where this, it's just constantly being active. So you'd be having this traffic going across there all the time. Even if I put them in different organizational units, which is one way of modeling this, um, of having under ACME an organizational unit for LA and an organizational unit for New York and then putting your users there. The domain is still considered one big area. And this is where sites can come in and play. Let me remove those. I'll remove that. Sites are a it's an Active Directory component that lets you keep them more or less isolated. So now I have a domain controller here and a domain controller there. And people in New York are using that one. The people in LA are using this one, primarily for local resources. Now there is some replication still going on. It's just not nearly the amount. So it's only parts that are required to do it. They're going to be synchronized, going back and forth. So it's much more efficient use of your bandwidth. Um, the user still can log in. So if I still need access to something over in New York, if I'm in LA, I can still do that. Um, because you know they are synced, I can still get that link. I still do have a WAN link there. It's just WAN, that's not right. Um, a WAN link, so I still have full traffic there. It's just more efficient use of that bandwidth I'm doing it. So to look at that, so if I look at my server. So is there a mention to doing it the first way then? Is there an advantage of doing what? Doing it the way where you just have constant replication. Um, Versus this way, which is more um, bandwidth. It's more bandwidth. The advantage of doing it the other way, it's just easier management. I don't have to think of where these people are. I don't have to even manage the site because once you work with sites, and, and this is, I have not worked a whole lot with sites. So let me see if I can get in here properly. Wait for this to start up. So if I look under Active, uh, Active Directory Users and Computers, wait for it to come up. I could go under Gropa or Acme or whatever, and when I create a new, um, I could make a new organizational unit, um, like New York, Los Angeles, and so it's more, it's, it's just kind of all right there for us, so that's an advantage of doing that way. If I want to work with sites, I go under Tools, and then I go to Active Directory Sites and Services. And underneath Sites, I don't have any sites right now. And I can create a new site, and I'll just call it New York. And it needs a link. Oh, can't have spaces. A site in New York has been created, and the link 
and then I create another new site and I'll call it LA. I have to link it this way. And then you have to configure things. Okay, what servers are going to be underneath each of those? And then you uh, another thing that you'd have to be aware of and you have to configure then is how do I know when I log in what site I'm part of? And so it's like, I don't know, here's a PC. Where am I? It has to do with base and IP addresses. So this office, because there's a wide area network, there's a router or routers between that, these are different networks. So they're going to have different network numbers. So this might be 172.16.204.0. That might be that network. Um, this might be 106.203.16.0. Might be that network. So if I'm in this range, <coughs> I'll know I'm part of this site. Therefore, I'll look to that domain controller to at log in. If, I'm, if my computer has an IP address of that range, then I'll look to that domain controller. So there's, there's definitely advantages to that. So does that answer the site question, kind of? Yeah, that's very close. Okay.